Hello. We are now going to combine two things that we've been talking about for the last few weeks, bases and dot products. I'm going to tell you about a kind of basis, which is very convenient and practical for working with dot products, and that type is called an orthonormal basis. So let's first remind ourselves what we've learned about bases. So if you have a subspace L, a basis for L is a set of vectors, V1, V2, etc. So that every element of L can be expressed in exactly one way as C1, V1, plus C2, V2, plus blah, 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 CK, VK. And we often write vectors in L using this, this vector of coefficients, C1 through CK. So this is writing a vector w in the coordinates of the basis v1 through vk. And we saw that sort of basic vector computations, things like vector addition, multiplying by matrices, we could do all those computations in coordinates. One thing we can't do well in coordinates is take dot products. So, for example, let L be the plane x plus y plus z equals zero at R3. Here's a basis. The vector one, two, three is represented in coordinates as the vector one, three, because one, two minus three is one times the first basis element plus three times the second basis element. But this is confusing for dot products. The, if we take the dot product of one, two, negative three by, with itself, we get 14. So this vector has length square root 14. It does not have length square root 1 squared plus the square root 3 squared is square root 10. So if we try to compute the length of this vector by dotting it with itself in coordinates, we get the wrong answer. And so I'm now going to tell you about a kind of basis where you will get the right answer, a kind of basis where you can compute lengths and angles when working in coordinates. Okay, a list of vectors v1, v2, blah, 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 vk is called orthonormal if all the vectors have length one and they are all perpendicular to each other. So in terms of the word here, ortho, that's like orthogonal, which means right angle, and normal, think, normalize to have length one. So there's two conditions here. The vectors are orthogonal. They have dot product zero with each other and they are normalized to have length one. And we can write that condition using dot products. vi dot vj is one when i equals j and zero when i does not equal j. So the first nice thing about orthonor um, so the first nice thing about orthonormal vectors is that they are automatically linearly independent. So I'll actually go quick back a slide a moment. So geometrically, if you want to think how should I visualize orthonormal vectors, they all have the same length and they're all nice and perpendicular. So here's one, here's another one, same length, perpendicular. You should think about them like a rigid frame that you would build a coordinate system on. So I've tried my best to make all my finger, my three fingers be perpendicular to each other and as best I could the same length. It's a sort of rigid frame that you would build a coordinate grid or a scaffolding out of with all your distances equal and all of your angles nice right angles. And if you look at that, you can see, oh, these vectors look linearly independent. There are not going to be dependencies between them. So that turns out to be right, and let's see it in algebra. Here's the corresponding algebra. I'm going to show you that these vectors are linearly independent. So suppose I had a linear relation between them. I could take a dot product of each side with the vector vj. So vj dot, this zero vector, will be zero. And if I distribute that out, I get c1 vj dot v1 plus c2 vj dot v2 etc, etc, cj vj dot vj is one of the terms, and then I keep going, ck vj dot vk. Every one of these dot products, vj dot v1, vj dot v2, etc, 
every one of these dot products is zero except for vj dot vj, which is one. So oh, every one of these terms is zero except the jth term, and the jth term gives me cj. So we compute that vj dot this whole messy thing is cj, and hence, since our assumption was that this thing in parentheses up here was zero, that tells us cj is zero. So we've shown that if we have any linear relation between orthonormal vectors, all the coefficients must be zero. That's what we mean when we say the vectors are linearly independent. So that's one nice thing about orthonormal vectors. We don't have to worry about whether there are any redundancies between them. Yeah, just the dot products will force there not to be. Which means there's always going to be a basis for the space they span, and therefore we can write things in coordinates using them. And the great thing about them is that we can compute dot products in coordinates. So if x, so if v1 through vk is an orthonormal basis, and x is a1, a2, ak in that basis, y is b1, b2, bk in that basis, then x dot y will be the dot product of the, the a vector and the b vector. And let's see why. It's just the distributive law once again. If I multiply this out, I'm going to get a sum of k squared many terms. Each one's going to have a vi dot of vj, and the coefficient of vi dot vj will be ai bj. But terms where i does not equal j are going to be zero. So this thing here. that's zero whenever if i is not j and it's one if i does equal j so in this sum of k squared many terms only the terms where i equal j survive and they look like this and so we've seen that the dot product of these two vectors is the dot product of the a vector and the b vector So that means whenever we have an orthonormal basis for our space, if we want to compute the lengths of vectors at L, the dot products between vectors at L, the angles between vectors at L, any sort of geometric thing that we build up using dot products, we could do it just working in those coordinates, in those k-dimensional coordinates. Okay. That's what orthonormal base, that's the main, first thing orthonormal bases are good for. In the next lecture, we'll see another thing they're good for, which is computing orthogonal projection. Before we do that, I just want to give you a piece of vocabulary. A matrix Q, let's have some matrix Q whose columns are V1 through VK. Then I claim to you that the V1 through VK are orthonormal if it only if Q transpose Q is the K by K identity matrix. And let's see why. Well, here's Q again, right here. That's Q. And here's Q transpose over here. When I take a transpose, the columns turn into rows. So in Q transpose, the vectors V go across. Then when I multiply this, I'm going to get a k by k matrix where I take each row of the first factor and dot it with each column of the second factor. So I'll get a square matrix of dot product, vi dot vj. And the definition of being orthonormal is exactly that the off diagonal dot products are zero and the on diagonal dot products are one. That's the identity matrix. Okay, so now there's a very unfortunate piece of terminology. A square matrix Q with Q transpose Q equals the identity is called an orthogonal matrix. And notice if it's square, then we can again rewrite this as Q transpose is Q inverse. So two words about this terminology. Um, your textbook refuses to address the question of whether I should call a rectangular matrix orthogonal if Q transpose Q is the identity. It only defines when square matrices are orthogonal. I will dodge the issue as well. 
but rectangular matrices with Q transpose Q equal the identity are quite important and will show up a lot because as we saw two slides ago, their columns are orthonormal vectors. But I will just keep saying a rectangular matrix with Q transpose Q equals identity because your textbook won't agree as to whether or not I should call that orthogonal. And then secondly, and this is not a complaint with your textbook, this is a complaint with the entire world of mathematics. The word should be orthonormal, not orthogonal. Q transpose Q is the identity if and only if the columns of Q are ortho orthonormal. If the columns of Q are orthogonal, but not orthonormal, Q transpose Q will be a diagonal matrix, but it won't be the identity. So if life were reasonable and sane, this, these would be called orthonormal matrices. And I'm just sorry, every single mathematical source in the world calls them orthogonal matrices. You're going to have to live with it. Um, it's just one of those unfortunate things about language that they don't have a name they should have. Okay, we are going to stop here. And um, the next lecture, we'll talk about another thing that orthonormal bases are good for, which is that they're good for computing orthogonal projections.